Hi, we're Em and Kate with Tubing Healthy, and today we are here with TJ Harlow, Home Health and Mold Consultant, and we're here to talk about all things environmental wellness. So we're really excited about this one, selfishly, because we know very little on this topic. So we have a bunch of questions and we're going to dive right in. So exactly. um, can you start by telling us your journey and how you got into this line of work? Absolutely. Thank you both for having me here. I'm always really excited to talk about this topic because there are truly so many people out there who are being affected by mold and their home environment, but really have no idea, you know? And so that's really the genesis of how I came into this world of toxicity. About five years ago, I was just your, you know, average mom, four kids, married, we had, you know, the house, the cars, you know, I worked a corporate job and was just moving on, moving on along. Yeah. And uh, I was at work and my hands started to hurt. It started there. And truly, honestly, I uh, thought that I had carpal tunnel and because I've worked in an, an office environment and on computers like my whole life. And so spending 10 hours a day on a computer, I was like, I'm bound to have this like ergonomic type illness. And so I kind of ignored it. I normalized it and was like, oh, maybe I'm getting old. And so then I started noticing that I was getting really tired, like really tired, like not normal, uh, you know, like my eyeballs like shutting and like, I have to like like nodding out almost. And I was like, what is happening to me? Like I'm sleeping. And this was during a period of my life when I was probably my healthiest I had ever been. Like I ran every day. I went to the gym. I lifted. I was like eating, counting macros, you know, like the whole deal. And so I couldn't understand what was going on. And then the symptoms just really rapidly started to pile up. So I started to lose my hair. I started to get like hot sweats, like I'd get really hot and sweaty and then I'd be cold and I'd get really hot and sweaty and then I'd be cold. I started having nightmares, then my joints started to hurt. And that was the point where I was like, okay, I think I really need to go to my doctor. So I went to my doctor and uh, did all kinds of lab tests and every, you name it, we did it and they all came back normal. And so I continued to kind of try to figure out what was this enigma. And they thought I had rheumatoid arthritis. They thought I had MS. You know, we went down this whole kind of rabbit hole and continued to, everything was fine. It even got to the point where I started to get gaslit because, you know, they can't find anything on your labs. It's, all in your mind. So uh, I, I assure you it was not in my mind. <laughs> and um, I hear that similar story from a lot of women that I work with. Um, talk about it all the yeah. time. Yeah. 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 So uh, finally, I guess it was about six months later, I got a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And that wasn't really sitting with me because there was no true root to that like but why why and so I was even exploring like previous trauma that I had had and you know even though I had done years of therapy and couldn't understand why was this happening now and finally uh about a year later and oh yeah I forgot don't want to miss out my family they started to get sick but nobody had the same symptoms like all of our symptoms were different they weren't all at the same intensity, you know, the kids were getting sick, nosebleeds, bedwetting, you know, kind of like uh, separation anxiety, like, like stuff that you wouldn't, you'd almost normalize it. You know, we normalize all these things. And this is the problem And my husband was saying, oh, I'm just getting old, I'm working too hard. That's why my shoulder hurts. And, and so finally we found mold in the house and it was totally by accident. And uh, while we were really relieved and we knew instantly like, this is it, this is, this is the cause. Like uh, it, it didn't make the journey much easier. In fact, it made it much harder because from the very beginning, 
it was so evident to us that there was just a lack of effort, expertise, a lack of educated professionals, uh, just no resources in both fields, whether it was in the health and wellness or whether it was in the mold industry, nobody knew any information about mold toxicity. And if they did, they would do the same thing. Oh, that's a quack illness. That doesn't exist. Or that's not real that, you know, that whole kind of deal. And so it was very isolating from the, you know, the whole entire experience was really led up from the most isolating experience to truly the darkest time of my life. I'll, I'll be honest, you know, it was really, really dark at that time because we ended up finding out our home was so toxic that we couldn't bring any of our stuff with us. We had to walk away. Like, like it literally went from one day, this is your home to the next day you're like, suited up in gear and you know goggles and masks and it's like a toxic wasteland and so to experience that you know was traumatic it truly was it was really traumatic for my entire family and I, i'm so blessed that my husband was supportive because a lot of women uh and families they don't have partners that you know, believe in them and believe that they're symptoms. They almost kind of believe the narrative that this is all mental and they're making it up. And so um, I know I'm taking a while to tell the story. No, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Yeah, that's so important to hear. <laughs> um, and so we ended up having to move in with my mother-in-law. It was, uh, I'm so grateful for her, for her, you know, allowing our whole family to move into her tiny house because it really wasn't, optimal for her. And uh, I was really sick, you guys. I was really sick. Like I, at that point, my cognitive skills were so poor. I couldn't work. I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk without stuttering. I couldn't drink out of a cup without choking. Um, and I was just so toxically overloaded with these mycotoxins. We had stachybotrys in our house, which is black mold, mm -hmm. and they produce mycotoxins called trichothecenes, and they are really, really severely toxic to human health. And um, like, it was really bad. Um, and my husband was working and, and taking care of me and the kids at the same time after losing all of our stuff and nobody believed us. It was awful. It was awful. And, and that pain truly was the driver when I started to realize that other people were experiencing this. It was still very underground at that point. That was like, you know, I, I kind of got the seed, you know, that was incepted there. Like, if I ever get out of this situation, I'm, I want to help people through this. And so I spent the next few years healing. I learned that I had Lyme disease too. And, you know, uh, it's usually never just one thing. And by the time I was ready to go back to work, I just, uh, I couldn't do it. I knew too much now, you know? And so I decided to go back to school, even though it wasn't the most like financially uh, <laughs> best decision since we had just like incurred the most losses we ever did in our whole life. But my husband was just so supportive and, and he really believed in me and my vision of, of what I wanted to create and do for people. And so I became a health coach practitioner and opened PJ Harlow Wellness. And uh, from the very gate, I was wanting to work in that very small niche of helping people with mold. And I was, I started helping people with health and just, you know, teaching people how to detox and, you know, how mold affects the body. And one of the foundations of that is that you can't heal when you're in mold or when you're in a, a poor environment. And most of my clients were just so overwhelmed with this topic. They, it was, you know, from trying to find inspectors to trying to find a good remediator. How do you get rid of mold? How do you get rid of mycotoxins? What do you do with your stuff? You know, how do you prevent it? You know, how do I test? And we were spending so much time on these topics that uh, one of my clients was like, PJ, you know, 
you should really start offering this as like kind of like a coaching topic. And I was like, really, do you think people would want to do that? And so I did. And to kind of go backwards a second, my previous career, I spent my entire life in the insurance industry. I was in, in, in underwriting, I was a claims adjuster. So I have that kind of background of water damage already like behind me. And then I kind of blended the health. So it's kind of given me a real kind of all encompassing uh, you know, really good base to be able to help people through this. And um, so I started helping people and it's really become the most popular topic at PJ Harlow Wellness. There's not real, I have yet to meet anyone else who's doing what we're doing. And I'm pretty proud of that. I feel like we're really kind of um, setting kind of the, the path or really, um, can't think of the right word, but really trying to be on the forefront of trying to change ideas and concepts around this topic because there's so much disinformation and improper, you know, kind of just practices happening. And so we were really founded on truth and providing people with the proper way to do things so they don't have to do it again and really supporting people through navigating this because it's hard so yeah so that's how I got where I am today it's like what you said that you were like getting you know gaslit that people didn't even give much credit to that it was a real thing so um that's an incredible story yeah. thank you for sharing that with us that's really I mean so when you say journey um you found the mold was it just kind of happenstance that you stumbled upon it like were you looking for it no my husband actually came home from work and he had a bad day and he's uh, really, I'm five one. you probably can't tell, but he's <laughs> like, he's like six two. And so we're always changing the shower head back and forth. You know, I bring it down, he pushes it up, you know, cause we're our height difference. And I think he hit it like a little bit too hard. Cause he was just like grumpy, like I had a bad day. And he hit it up to like push it up. And when he did, it popped off of the kind of the, the pipe sticking out and a bunch of water went into the wall. And on that opposite side of the wall was our kitchen. And all this water came gushing under our appliances. And so when he came out, we pulled everything out and that was like all of our cabinets and our stove and everything. We pulled everything out because you don't normally go back there. I, I We never did. Mm -hmm. And when we pulled all that out, there was all this black and the drywall was so wet, you could stick your finger through it. And I was like, that wasn't from that. Like that was like three seconds of water. And so when we kind of really went behind all the cabinetry, there was like a gap about this big. And the whole wall was just, it was all black in there. And so we ended up finding out that our entire crawl space, the subflooring, um, all the mold was in our walls. So we didn't see anything. We didn't smell anything. It was just kind of pumping through our HVAC system, literally poisoning us slowly in our own home. And then the sicker I got, the more I stayed home and the sicker and sicker and sicker I became. And so um, it's a very common theme that I see. Wow. It's funny because our next question was that, you know, it's that belief that mm -hmm. if you don't see any mold, there is none, but that's very much not the case. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of kind of misconceptions about, you know, mold being in a home from there's, I, I kind of, do this like little break the myth thing sometimes on my Instagram. And one of the kind of uh, myths is, is that mold only grows in like old decrepit homes or something. And that's completely untrue. I see mold in brand new homes all the time because we leave our, the way that we have our building practices, we leave our materials, you know, mold likes wood, mold likes drywall, we build our homes out of kind of glorified paper. And, you know, we build them so tight that, you know, there's certain areas that need to be ventilated and certain areas that need to be conditioned and dehumidified. And so if you've got mold all over the kind of frame of your house, and then 
most construction people are, you know, in the construction world, it's not necessarily anybody's fault, but the idea is, is that mold is no big deal. It's just lumber mold. It's just that mold is dormant, you know, that's the kind of things that you hear. And so they'll build a home with soaking wet wood and then put up all the drywall, install your, you know, the lungs of your home, your HVAC system, you'll buy a brand new home and move in and the family starts getting sick and they don't know why. And you wouldn't see anything. I mean, I've seen mansions, beautiful mansions that are full of mold. And um, so you can have, uh, that's kind of, when I keep mentioning the HVAC system, that's one of kind of the really notable places that we find mold is in, is in those systems. So is in the walls the most kind of typical place that it's- Crawl spaces, okay. walls, and HVAC systems and attics. Those, those spaces that we don't spend a lot of time in Mm -hmm. especially crawl spaces and basements, you know, uh, and even attics as well. We take HVAC systems, which literally I keep saying they're the lungs of the home. They're, they're, this is where you get your air from. And we shove these systems into these spaces because we want the real estate you know we want the prime real estate for our our living rooms and we don't want to look at these ugly big machines you know but that is part of the problem is where we put these things it's it's like um i had a client last week and i was trying to explain to them like you put a machine that's built to cool your home in an attic that is going to get in upwards of 150 degrees in the summertime, right? And think of it like a hot summer day and you open a soda or a drink, you know, that's cool, even a glass drink and you set it down and you look over and it starts to sweat on the outside and that condensation forms. The same thing happens inside your vents when it's trying to cool or the you know either way opposite and so when we have dust and particulates and skin cells and all of this is is kind of collected in those vents that's how mold starts to grow and you would never know unless i mean who climbs in their vents you can't oh, even look yeah because yeah. you were saying you know mm -hmm. sometimes they build it with wet wood and then it's you know, it's in the walls. How often is this mold actually very harmful? Because I'm sure mold is everywhere. Is it likely that it's harming you in some way, even if it's not black mold? So you're very right. And, and mold spores are everywhere. Okay. And I think that, you know, we'll kind of get into this a little bit later when we talk about what equates to a healthy home. Mm -hmm. Right. And so Yes, mold spores are everywhere and there's all kinds of mold spores everywhere. There's, you know, household molds, you know, normal household molds like cladosporium and there's other more toxic molds that are also pretty common in your home. But it's when the home microbiome becomes imbalanced mm -hmm. is just kind of like when you're talking about your gut microbiome when that becomes imbalanced, you know, that's when you start to have all these problems. And so when we have these areas that are promoting uh, or, or the terrain that is attractive to mold, mold is a competitive species and so is bacteria. So if a building is sick and, and has that kind of, you know, wet areas that aren't being mitigated, then it's really likely that, you know, I would say every home has a little bit of toxic mold in it, you know, but it, it's when you allow these areas for it to proliferate and actually become a problem, that's when it becomes a problem. It takes over mm -hmm. and then you get the symptoms. Yeah, yeah. So for like a first time home buyer, someone that's, you know, doing the regular mold inspection, but sometimes people opt for that, how often should someone be checking their home for mold? Is this like a yearly thing? And you know, sometimes you don't see it, like you said. Or can I jump in and yeah. also, so like she said, people will get the mold inspection done before they buy a house. Um, but 
do you recommend doing your own mold testing anyway if that's not a very reliable because with real estate they'll want to sell the house or make downplay it would you even recommend listening oh, to that that's true, yeah true. so when you're if you're talking about buying a home normally you're going to have what's called just a, a regular home inspection when you, and that's a different from an actual mold inspection and Unfortunately, we are in a time right now where it's exciting because there's a lot of change happening in this industry. Mm -hmm. And, but it's also saddening in some ways because, you know, it's kind of like, um, how can I even compare it to anything? But, it, it, you know, as, as far as the knowledge that's out there, I would say, almost 99% of mold inspectors, people trained in this industry are not going to agree with pretty much anything I say because they're educated not to. And so what I'm doing and some of the people that I've connected with colleagues, what we're doing is very new. It's very cutting edge. You know, we are kind of paving that way of really trying to make change. It's part of what we want to happen. And it starts with awareness. That's why I love talking about this and kind of educating people on, on the truth of what's happening. But when you buy a home, I, I believe that everybody should do, it's called an ERMI test. And it's actually, uh, to preface that a little bit, the standardized testing for mold is an air sample and they'll bring in this little machine and they'll kind of suck a little bit of air into it and then they'll look at what's in that air okay but that is not a good enough picture of what we're being exposed to on a daily basis okay but if you look at the dust Okay, we're looking at the DNA of mold spores in the dust. Mold uses dust as like an Uber, like a taxi. It uses it, it latches onto it, and that's how it kind of moves around your house. And so we're able to kind of look into the dust and get a good idea. Uh, we kind of have a baseline of what's normal, and then we can see what species are elevated in that kind of uh, control there, that test. And so I really think not even just environmentally sensitive people, but I think that uh, everyone should really do this kind of a test. I can't tell you how many clients I've worked with that have purchased new homes, even if it's not necessarily new, new, like just built new, but just a new home for them. And this is how they became sick or this is how they have issues because you, there's only so much inspecting you can do to a certain degree to where you really need to do some kind of test because um, for instance, let somebody, somebody flipped a house, okay? All that kind of visual evidence is gone now. So, so it's gonna look great, you know, but if you test the dust, then you're gonna be able to see something that you might not be able to see visually by inspecting. Does that make sense? Yeah, it really. Does. So you would say that's just like the standard thing you'd recommend. Yeah, basically, yeah. everyone do. Mm -hmm. And how often yeah. should someone be inspect? And you know, you do the initial inspection, and if you're in the clear, how often does someone need to be checking their house for mold? Well, it depends on if they're an environmentally sensitive individual, like if you're just talking about a regular person or if you're talking about someone who is really trying to heal from environmental illnesses because there's kind of different levels of, of standards of what I would consider there. But if it's just, you know, your average person, um, if they were really good at uh, understanding their home, uh, I would say that it wouldn't truly be necessary unless maybe once or twice uh, every few years, unless they were feeling like some kind of symptoms or if they know they had some kind of an event. I'm really big on understanding your house first and foremost, because it's not something that we're taught. You know, people buy houses all the time, but they don't understand the mechanics of you know, their air handler, their HVAC system, their condenser, their sump pump, you know, they don't understand, you know, that how that these things should be cared for. And, uh, you know, there's just not enough education about how 
things should be mitigated properly. But if you do, and this is part of what we do at PJ Harlow Wellness is we teach people how to inspect your own homes, how to care for them, how to uh, eliminate a lot of these risks, or at least kind of, I, I'm also really big on not falling into the perfection trap because there's no perfect way to do things and to really kind of think of more of it as a concept of diluting the amount of toxicity we're exposed to. You know, it's crazy when you say how much it can affect, it's our air that we're breathing, mm -hmm. we're in our homes, you know, most of the time and that there's so little attention paid to it. It, when it can have such a detrimental effect on health, mm -hmm. it is wild and yeah. you know, more attention isn't kind of focused on oh, this. Yeah. So what would you say are kind of some basic practices for a newbie to implement to keep their home healthy? So they did the mold test. Now, like, what can we do to keep our home sure. smoothly mm -hmm. like that? Sure. Um, it's kind of gross, but uh, first and foremost, head into your bathroom and clean your drains. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I make really disgusting videos on Instagram about uh, cleaning drains, um, but I do them purposely to show people, uh, like for instance, there's an overflow hole in your sink. And if you're looking at your bathroom sink, it's usually the hole that's like right by your stomach that when you're brushing your teeth, you hang over it. People don't know that you're supposed to clean that hole. And there's even little brushes you can get, but it, it's, it will grow mold and it will even start to stink somehow. Um, and there, if you've never cleaned it, it's probably, I have some videos on my Instagram. They're really gross, yeah. uh, but they have bacteria and they're full of mold. Um, and even sometimes toxic molds can be in there. Um, similarly to that, uh, your shower drain, if you have just like a regular standing shower and you can pop the little, you know, drain in the middle off, those get clogged up with hair, with bacteria. I mean, they're not, wear PPE, you know, you should be wearing gloves. And that, was my, that was my next yeah. question, because if you're kind of messing around and say there is a bunch of mold and you're lifting it into the air and then breathing it, should you be wearing, you know? Yes, yes, definitely be wearing a mask. I always wear gloves when I clean, no matter what. So I try to teach people to get in that habit. Um, even though I don't use any kind of toxic chemicals when I'm cleaning, it's just a good idea to protect yourself and kind of just, it's a habit, you know? Um, but I would clean those and kind of, you know, you want to kind of find foundationally clean. And, and so I'm also really big on, there's a difference between kind of foundationally setting up everything or decontaminating, even if it's a, a minor kind of practice and then sustaining that balance, that, that, that microbiome in your home. So, um, I think that people need to change their cleaning habits too. And, you know, especially because we are in this time period right now where all of our lives have changed since COVID happened. And, you know, we're indoors more, but we're also in this kind of societal kind of like think, group think that like kill all germs and all microbes are bad. And it's like microbes get a really bad rap, but we're microbial. Like, I think that there's people don't know that like we're, we have more microbial DNA than we do human. So I thought that was like fascinating yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know I we're read this not ourselves and we yeah. are ourselves. Wow. Yeah, I read this book called uh, Psychobiotic Revolution, and um, it's a fantastic book, one of my favorite books. But in that book, they're talking about, you know, it, they quote that. That's where I got that quote from. And they're talking about the fact that, you know, our microbes are doing a lot of the decision making for us. Like, even when you are attracted to someone, it's not even you being attractive. It's that your microbes like each other, right? So it's oh, like, it blew my mind, you know? So like, interesting. Like, no, like <laughs> even when you have, a, you know, when newborns are, are, you know, first born, you know, they get that first kind of 
microbiota from their mother in the birth canal. And it's why it's so important to have that skin to skin contact with dad and mom and the inner family. So it's because, so your microbes can start to kind of communicate, but your house has that microbiome, right, too. And so we want to keep that healthy. So I was bringing this up and, and kind of I'm bringing it back around now is because, you know, I feel like people abuse disinfectants and they abuse these products that are built to sanitize and kill. And, and we're kind of all feared up because nobody wants to get sick and everybody's afraid. And so it's like, you know, and there, there's all these new marketing companies coming out with, you know, all of these sprays and, you know, walking through mists and, you know, I've seen all yeah. the crazy things. And um, I, I really believe that, you know, you, you have to balance those things because if you kill the bad stuff, you kill the good stuff too. And then what is the point? Are we meant to live in sterility? Because that's not what we are. And I mean, we're not trying to make laboratories. We're, we're trying to make healthy environments. And, and I really think it, it really comes around back to like your own immune system and what's really good for that and kind of having a, a I guess, non-Westernized understanding of how the immune system works and, this, and similarly apply that to your home as well. So when you're cleaning, those drains, you know, just use good old soap and water, right? Because there's a difference between cleaning and disinfecting. And I think marketing has kind of made us believe that we can do both at the same time, but that's truly not true. Like you can clean and then you can disinfect. Even when we're talking about bleach, for instance, which I never ever recommend using, by the way, because it actually encourages mold growth. It doesn't Mm -hmm. uh, remove mold growth. It's primarily water, but bleach is a pesticide actually, but it's used for disinfectant frequently. But for instance, if we were talking about we're in a bathroom and you've got a toilet and you're trying to disinfect it or something, if there's any kind of urine there, it will immediately take away the efficacy of the bleach. So you have to make sure that's clean first and then you could use the disinfectant, which you let sit for about 10 minutes. You know, I like to use force of nature for that. It's non-toxic and, you know, much safer and you're not inhaling all of that toxicity. But, but that's where I would kind of start as far as cleaning and really kind of learning a little bit more about the products that you're using and why you're using them. Um, and drains or something I'd clean and start learning about your house, you know, inspect all of these places. Dishwashers are another one that are bacterial, you know, fungal havens, uh, and even your refrigerator, like when you open the door and there's like the little ribbing, uh, mm -hmm. the seal right there that can get mold behind the fridge and, uh, start learning about your HVAC system. And that's another really big tip that I can give people as far as uh, how to how to mitigate better. Yeah, this is all stuff I don't do at all. So I'm making a little checklist. This is so important. Yeah, yes. it is it is interesting uh, because it is such a time now mm -hmm. of disinfecting everything mm -hmm. that I yeah. wonder how it's kind of gonna, how COVID's gonna Point alter. Time. Yeah, because it's very common. Like you said, you just disinfect your whole house. That's like the common practice, disinfect doors, you know, mm -hmm. fridge handles, we just kind of are in that trained Kill habit of doing it mm -hmm. all the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's scary. It's scary to me because we already build our homes to, I mean, it, for, I guess for a long time, I hated mold. After what happened to me, I felt like mold destroyed my life. Like I literally was like, I hate you. I hope all mold dies. Like I never want to talk about mold. And now here I am, I talk about mold every day, but um, kind of the irony. <laughs> but, um, and then I really started to learn more about it. And, you know, it, it has a very almost divine purpose in life, you know, and it is a life, it brings life back to, to, to the world. And it's a decomposer. It's only doing its job. Um, and, you know, we build our homes 
out of paper. And so when we have all of this moisture and we're not controlling it, I mean, that's the key right there is you, you have to control the, the moisture in your house and make sure that there's not leaks and there's not areas for it to grow because if you allow it, 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 it will grow. And so, um, but, but it is really scary to me, like everything that's uh, kind of the, the way that we're moving. And, and I don't think that that's why I work so hard to really kind of change the way people think about their homes and to really start understanding uh, what's happening. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That seems like that would be the, you know, kind of the common, I would want that to be the common thing when you're buying a house or your agent is taking your house to kind of have that part of a, you know, decision, decision yeah, making and kind of yeah. absolutely not just like what color, you know, the kitchen is, but like <laughs> the stuff behind that, that seems like the more important way to go about it. So this is, yeah, I know you said too, that you started getting sick and mm -hmm. then your kids started getting sick. Um, so mold does affect everybody differently or more severely to some, because one of my good friends, she, um, she was working as a lawyer in an office building and she, she got really, really sick. And they found out they had black mold in the building and they cleared it all out. And she still can't go back because she's mm -hmm. so, so sensitive to it. Um, is yeah. that just her or is, do some people react stronger to the symptoms of mold and some do a better job or? So there's a couple different factors there. So there's the theory of toxic load. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about toxic load, I'll give you an example. So imagine everybody is walking around with a little bubble on their head and over top of my bubble, it says 89% and it's a percentage, right? And, and technically I'm a bucket and this is my full, my fullness mm -hmm. is the little percentage. And I'm 89% and I'm 89% because in my life, I've lived in multiple moldy homes. Um, I had mercury amalgams in put in my in my mouth when I was young. Um, I've gotten bitten by multiple ticks. I have Lyme disease. Um, I've experienced a lot of trauma in my younger years. Um, been in some really bad relationships and gone through a lot of stuff and had just a lot of bad things happen to me in my life. Um, so that affects the body as well. And so all of these things kind of contribute to the amount of toxicity in your body. And so in addition to that, then you throw in genes, right? So I have a couple gene markers that make my body uh, a little bit more sensitive to mold, not necessarily in an allergenic way, but more so my body struggles to remove toxins out properly. And so there's a lot of people who have spe specific like haplotypes and genes that make that kind of uh, epigenetically, it can turn on. Uh, and so for me, I was the canary, as they say, the canary in the coal mine. So I got sick very quickly because my percentage was high when I moved into the really toxic house. My husband, on the other hand, grew up in England and he, you know, he didn't have fillings. He didn't have all of these different exposures to toxins and things. So he was at probably like 40% when he moved in. So mold and mycotoxins, it's the mycotoxins that actually are poisoning you, which they're like the equivalent of like how a snake has venom, right? They're not alive per se, they're a toxin, but they're literally poisoning you. And so the mold will sporulate mycotoxins in an attempt to protect itself. It does that when it feels threatened. When mold is in a house, um, it's a competitive environment and they're competing against other molds and other bacteria. They all want to be king of the castle. And so that's what that's kind of like their built-in defense system. And so we inhale those toxins in the spores or spores can break into little fragments. And so depending on 
what the level of the exposure is, including all of those other factors, will determine how sick a person can get. And so that's why there's it, it affects everybody completely differently, but eventually it will affect everyone who lives in the home if they're there long enough. It's just their levels of overall toxicity are different and they might, uh, one other thing is that when you look at it, like the level of toxins you're taking in and your ability and, and the, the uh, fastness of how, how quickly you move them out of the body. So for someone like me, I get stuck in a state of accumulation where I'm just, I'm not excreting, I'm just accumulating, accumulating, accumulating and then it's like, ah, I, I can't function. And so, um, so those are all kind of the, the it's, it's a little complex, but I hope I, I explained well, it. It actually well. reminds me because we both um, have this condition called mast cell activation disorder and we can't break down histamine properly. So we often describe it and it really reminded me when you're like, I'm at 89% because our doctor, the way he explained it to us was, you know, everyone has a problem when you fill up your bucket and it you're fine this. if your bucket's not overflowing. Yeah. As soon yeah. as your bucket overflows, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So if you've had a lot of histamine and it's overflowing, you know, yeah. that's when absolutely I was thinking the same thing. So exactly. you do have mold exposure. I know you were saying it took you years. Um, is it the same type of thing where it changes person to person for how long it takes to detox? And can you fully recover once you have had extreme mold exposure like that? You can, you can. Um, I don't want anybody to feel like, you know, it's, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. um, usually most people have more than just mold. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very rare, you know, that you'll see somebody with just mold. So it's, it's very much working with somebody who's very versed in environmental illnesses. Usually people are very uh, commonly have Lyme, co-infections, mast cell, multiple chemical sensitivity, dysautonomia, you know, they'll kind of have a, a bunch of different things, but mold is one of those things where it's equally an illness as it is a trigger. It's one of those root triggers that kind of takes people totally to the other side. But um, as far as healing, it's very hard to give like a number for that as because like everybody is so different, but I usually like to tell clients that expect it to take at least half as long as you've been sick to try to heal. And then of course, you know, there's a lot of obstacles with healing that I see. And you guys probably see this too. I see lots of people who have kind of like a shiny object type syndrome where, you know, they can't stick to a regimen. And it's kind of like, you know, we're all on social media and you see like, oh, that's, that's helping her. That's my answer. Oh, or, oh, wait, yeah. that, oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so if you can't, it needs to be, someone needs to really stay consistent because you have to kind of get into a good supplement schedule you also have to really work to get your 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 um your drainage pathways open and get sweating and stick with it you know and kind of stay stay consistent um can you talk to me a little about the detoxing process detoxing in general is just always a very interesting sure to me so um you mentioned sweating um i imagine like an infrared sauna type thing what else would be like a great practice to, if you're, you know, you feel like you had mold exposure or you confirmed you had mold exposure, you want to detox, what would be kind of the best route to take with that? Absolutely. First and foremost, you know, you need to be out of mold, but mm -hmm. I do want to touch on that. There are many people out there who just can't, you know, like I get it. Not everybody has the money to do remediation. It's not cheap. It's very expensive. Not everybody has a choice to go move in with somebody else or just go get a new place. So, um, you know, you can try to do things again with that perfection trap. I try to say, you know, whatever you're doing to try to dilute the amount of toxicity can, can help. But as far as people know in their expectations that they're not going to be able to, to do the full the full healing, unless they kind of address, that's a foundational piece. Um, 
Another foundation is drainage, you know, making sure that your lymphatics are draining, making sure that um, you're supporting your liver, your kidneys, your gallbladder, and uh, really kind of um, doing things like dry brushing or sauna, coffee enemas, you know, things like that to uh, get the body excreting, get your skin sweating, make sure that you're drinking a ton of water, um, at least, you know, half your body weight in ounces per day. And th those are kind of like starter things. Um, I'm real big on kind of mentioning those other things because I think that, you know, we've also also been brought up that we sometimes I see people bring the kind of Western mindset into functional medicine. And it's like the focus is all on supplements. And, it, and, and supplements are, they're not going to do it alone. Like there needs to be other kind of therapies and methods, you know, um, there's all kinds of things you know, I've seen people do ozone therapy on their body. And you mentioned red light therapy and sauna. And another big piece of detoxing from mold is working on your nervous system. And mold does a lot of damage to the limbic system and really puts people in a state where they are stuck in that fight or flight and they can't regulate anymore. And so they really have to work on doing some kind of neuroplasticity work. It's probably the least favorite thing that anybody wants to work on because it's like, it's so much easier to take a supplement and take a binder, you know, binders are a big part of it to help uh, get those toxins out and, and even trying to ensure that your pathways are open as well. Um, I, a lot of people also have, there's mold allergy, which we're not referencing right now, but there's also mold toxicity. There's also uh, SIRS, which is a chronic inflammatory response syndrome that many people also have. It's like an, an inflammatory cytokine storm that happens. And then there's also mold colonization where you can actually get mold that colonizes in your gut and in your nasal cavity. And so depending on who you're working with and what level of mold that you have, um, then there's different ways that you need to really be kind of strategizing to detox the right way. But I'm a firm believer in all the, uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. And for each thing that you just mentioned, there's a way, there's tests to find out kind of how yeah. you are affected mm -hmm. by that. Okay. So, yes. then, so get, figure out how the mold is affecting you and then target it in a more precise way. Yeah, there's, uh, for mycotoxins, which is toxicity, there are two labs that you can do. It's a urine test that you would test to see what mycotoxins you're excreting. For uh, SIRS, there's actually a, it's a bunch of different blood tests that you can do. Even if you Googled like SIRS labs, C-I-R-S labs, it would come up and show you all, it's like a whole panel of lab tests that you would get. Um, and for colonization, you could do uh, an organic acids test to really look at the fungal markers that come up. There are several that can show whether you've got aspergillus that's colonized in the gut. Interesting. Wow. Okay, so interesting. I know this, just hearing you say like the dry brushing water, I'm like, oh, I just slack on this stuff so often. Um, but you mentioned something earlier also that sometimes people don't have, you know, all the funds to allocate towards healing. And I did a deep dive on your product page because mm -hmm. I'm such a product junkie and a bunch of them were new to me. So I was mm -hmm. like taking notes and researching um, all the companies about stuff that I didn't, I was like, what is this? Yeah. It was like that kind of bowl thing. And uh, you know, I just, all these deep dives. Yeah. But my point is, if someone has limited funds to um, dedicate to this, what would you kind of rank as the most important? And then, you know, a few after that. Sure, sure. For environment, I would start with getting a hygrometer, which is under $20. And especially if you live in an area that you already kind of know is humid mm -hmm. and start kind of tracking the humidity levels in your home. Humidity is something that can, if you start to control it, you can prevent mold growth. Usually people would say, I want an air purifier first, but 
you've got to solve the issue before you can start to be kind of proactive and start to clean it. But um, I would probably get a dehumidifier as well would be one of the top purchases. Um, that's not super cheap, but um, you can get them pretty affordable even on Amazon. Uh, an air purifier is something that I would definitely invest in. There's a difference between a purifier and a filter. Mm. Sometimes you can get both. They're a little bit on the pricier end. So if someone didn't have the funds to do that, you could make your own uh, kind of air filter in a way where you could get like a box fan and you could tape a 20 by 20 filter um, you could probably do this for under 50 bucks. I have actually have it on my website and you could put that in a window and, you know, bring in fresh air that's filtered and maybe open a window on the other side. So you're making kind of mechanical ventilation to bring fresh air in and allow, allow the toxic air to kind of go out if you were stuck in mold. I would also, uh, clean and make sure that you're dusting with microfiber cloths and, and vacuuming frequently. I might even remove uh, some of the carpets in your house if you could uh, and get rid of a lot of the clutter is another thing because if there's a lot of clutter, you're allowing lots of dust to find all these nooks and crannies and dust is part of the problem. If you have a lot of dust in your home, you wanna kind of mitigate that yeah. it's ubering it round no, I know that. <laughs> that is my <laughs> visual thing of that that's that's great yeah it seems like very doable steps to kind of start that process with yeah you. there's also some cleaner products too that I like um I try to keep it pretty simple I really like branch basics that works yeah, okay. that. 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 okay we're mm -hmm. on the right track yes yeah, okay. yeah I like branch basics to you know kind of be my cleaner or even just simple dish soap and water I love force of nature that's another one of my products and there's a couple actual um uh, Microbalance Health makes a, uh, and Remedy as well, make two kind of products that you could maybe spray in your shower, um, you know, once every two weeks or something just to kind of be a preventative as well. Um, I can imagine this is all, you know, very overwhelming to someone who's coming into this world um, who doesn't really have any experience with mold in the past. Mm. What would you say to people who kind of don't even want to open this can of worms? Um, they think, mm -hmm. oh, it's not worth it, or this is too overwhelming. It's too much information. There's too many, you know, steps. Mm -hmm. How would you kind of, you know, address that and, and debunk that mindset? Well, I see that, to be honest, I see that quite frequently, you know, it, it, it especially in men. And that's not in anything against men. It's just, you know, it's, it's, and I see it really, I can't say that. I see it in all kinds of people. It, and it's like, it's easier to just ignore it mm -hmm. and kind of pretend that it's not there because it's so overwhelming to even kind of start thinking about it. And it's that. a lot of work. But, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But this is kind of why a big kind of reason why I do what I do, because I've worked really hard to break all this down into very tangible steps for people. So we help guide them through this process. So it's not so overwhelming because it truly is. It's, there's so much to learn and unpack with this that people just don't have the time. They don't have, and, and I, one of the things I love about this kind of broader community, the health and wellness community is that everybody wants to do everything the right way, right? We don't wanna do things the wrong way. We wanna do things the right way. And we sit down and we research and we go, you know, we dive into these rabbit holes and start learning about all these topics. But mold is one of those things that it's so big that, you know, it really needs to be handled but work with someone like myself. Not, I'm not trying to, you know, say, come work with me, but, oh, but really, yeah. you know, it's, it's necessary. And 
you know, we can get through this together. So you don't have to try to, uh, I'm here to give you the cliff notes, you know, like I'm here. So you don't have to spend three years learning about this topic. So you can figure out how to get a proper mold inspector. So you can save money. So you're not stressed out. So you can trust that when I say, no, don't worry about that, then you can go, whew, okay, she knows that that's right, you know. Um, you didn't like work. Yeah. Yeah. So you learned yeah. it all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, but as far as, you know, even just approaching the topic, you know, especially if you're having symptoms. And even if you're not, you don't want to have symptoms, you know, because I've met people from both camps, people who aren't sick and people who are, you know, totally so sick that they can't function. And, you know, to, to both, it's like, you're not going to get better and you're not going to get better either. Like you're, you know, and it, it's necessary. It's, it's foundational. So it's so important, uh, especially if you have children, you know, and your house is like, it's everything. And look how much time we spend in our homes now. I mean, I, I don't even leave the house sometimes. All the, all the time. All the time. <laughs> I work here. I, I, it's like, you know, and so it's so critical moving forward that we really start to address these things. And it doesn't have to be done all at once. There are so many different ways to handle this and, and things that people might be overwhelmed about. It, it's just they might not even realize that there's many different solutions to, to be able to handle that. And there's so many different things that we can do that we'll figure out a way we'll get through it. Like it's possible. I love that. Uh, that and for, for those watching, you do virtual appointments. All I, do. I do. Okay. I work internationally. So I work with people all over the world. I've worked with people from Russia to Australia, Spain, the UK, all over the United States. Um, and so we can do, we can even do testing for people as well. We sell army tests and all different kinds of at-home tests on our website for people who are outside. Oh, I know, me too now. now. <laughs> yeah. For people who are outside of the U.S., you know, there's instructions, just email me and I'll tell you how we do our, our testing for people outside as well, because there's only those labs are only in the U.S., but we've, you know, we've managed to figure out a way to for that as well. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. We will link um, your information in the description and then on our blog as well. But thank you for the like yeah, tons of information. So informative and such a topic that we were so interested in as well. So thank you so much for my pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. It was my pleasure. I'm honored to be here. And so thank you so much. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you.